Today on Virginia Legends Podcast, I have Jason Wallace, a uh, defensive back on the 1990 uh, mythical UVA team that at one point was number one in the country. Uh, Jason, or, or J-Dub, um, is from Hampton, uh, played at Bethel, uh, I believe class of, of, not, of 87, right? 87, yes. 87. Yeah, so uh, Jason, thanks for, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Of course. Well, you know, it's kind of tough times for the football community at UVA. Um, you know, we had the, we had this uh, shooter, a uh, mass, mass shooter that targeted football players, you know, very, very bizarre um, yeah. uh, circumstance. Uh, mm-hmm. have, you, have, you, have you talked to a lot of your football teammates? What, what, uh, what is the mood in the, uh, in Virginia's football community? You know, I did talk to a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of my teammates, uh, a lot of former athletes in general, and everyone was just in a, in a state of shock. And, um, it, it really, for me personally, it, it just cut really deep. It was, uh, it was a very disturbing and, and, and moving situation and emotional situation because of, uh, you know, just placing yourself, myself in, in, in those kids' shoes, uh, you know, and, and imagining that happening to one of my teammates, one of my one of my lifelong friends, one of my brothers. Um, I, I just can't even imagine uh, the the level of grief that that the, the, those guys were going through, and it it was just it was just a very emotional period for me. And and here I am, you know, half halfway around, the, you know, away from across the country, and it still brought me to tears, you know, several times, you know, just thinking about it and. Um, you know, it definitely made a lot of guys reach out to to uh, other guys. Uh, you know, just to tell them, tell them you love them, tell them uh, you miss them, uh, and, and you appreciate their brotherhood and their friendship. And I've been really pleased to see the band, the bonding uh, of of all of the former athletes and and the former fo- football alumni in particular, and determined being determined to. Uh, make sure that the, the lives and legacies of those kids that lost their lives, the, the Sean uh, Lavelle and, and uh, Darren to, to always live on. And, um, you know, we're going to make that happen. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to be a part of that. And I'm excited to see what the end result of, of all of our collective efforts is. Yeah. It was also nice to see how the other schools honored uh, the, the players. Uh, you know, because you know, we were, football is full of Type A personalities, as, as you know. We'll get to, yeah. but it was just kind of great how everyone kind of uh, came together for a, ter- uh, a terrible event. All around the country, and um, it, it was it was moving to to see the different schools, the different conferences. Um, you know, everyone uh, really banding together to make sure that they showed the support and the and the love towards uh, UVA football and the UVA football family. Yeah. Now let's let's try to move on to this, uh, uh, a happier time. Um, mm-hmm. you, you know, so the other day I was watching ESPN and another show came on about the 1990 season. Uh, and there's a new ACC uh, football special. Uh, that, that season, uh, you know, for, for folks who don't remember, UVA for the first time had, had risen to prominence under George Welsh and, um, you know, was on top of the world uh, very briefly. It was an amazing moment. I was there in school too. And, uh, often do people ask you about that season and how often uh, do you think about it? Um, you, well, you think about it every September uh, for sure. You know, every, every year that football season starts, um, you know, you go back to those, those good old days and, and you think about um, the ascension that we were, I was blessed to be a part of, uh, of Virginia football rising all the way to number one ahead of, all of the, the, the superpowers, if you will, of, of college football, especially in that day, the Michigans, the Notre Dames, the Miamis, the Clemsons, you know, the uh, Florida States of the world to be ranked ahead of all of them. Uh, it was a huge, huge accomplishment. And it, it brought a, a whole level, a new level of uh, uh, respect for the program at that time. It brought a whole new level of uh, uh, exposure 
to to the community and, and to UVA football. And it was just, it was really exciting time to be a part of that. I know I was getting interviewed two or three times a day, every every day during those weeks while we were uh, ranked number one in the country. And uh, it, it was really cool to think back on it. Do people still ask you about that season? You know, it, in Virginia, more so than, than being down in Texas. Uh, but it's one of those things uh, that when I bring it up, uh, people are still are still shocked about. And, uh, you know, I take great pride in, in making sure everybody knows uh, that that happened and, and, you know, who we, who was, who was looking up at us at, at that time. Yeah. Well, one thing I've always heard about you, even, even before I met you, is that you come from a really great family. People talked about that even back in school. Um, tell us, uh, and, and Ray Roberts, um, as I discussed with Ray, Ray was a, a six foot seven uh, kind of shy kid from, from Asheville, uh, North Carolina, who right. ended up playing in the NFL, had a great career in the NFL, but uh, was, was a poor kid and mm -hmm. came to UVA at a time when a different world was on TV. And you know, a lot of people at UVA had money. And here was a kid mm -hmm. that you know wore the same clothes every day, wore his athletic wear, wore, wore his athletic wear around campus. Uh, but your, your parents stepped in and helped him. Uh, yes. tell, tell us about your, your parents and, and your family. Yeah, my parents, um, you know, they were first generation college graduates. Um, and and my, my mom was a lifelong teacher. Uh, educator and my dad worked uh, his entire career in city government. Um, so my entire time while I was in college, he was either the assistant city manager or the city manager and later on became the mayor of my hometown in Virginia, which is Hampton. And, you know, we were blessed to, to grow up in a lower middle class uh, home and we got to UVA. We, we were, another reason we were blessed to be able to do some things to uh, to help Ray was that you know my older brother went to school uh, didn't pay for his his education through uh, he went to the Naval Academy um, I was blessed to get a scholarship to go to Virginia my uh, younger brother was blessed to get a scholar, football scholarship to play at Duke that's uh, but it's a it's a football family you know my dad and both of his brothers also went to school. Uh, on football scholarships at, at HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. One was at Virginia State, one was at North Carolina Central, and the other one was um, up at Maryland, University of Maryland Eastern Shore. So, um, you know, we, have, we come from a long line of, uh, of, of athletes. And, um, you know, when we met Ray, uh, uh, Ray was my roommate. Uh, in, in college, uh, in summer prep at, at UVA, and then on, and uh, in, in for the rest of the time I was at UVA. And when he first came to school, it was one of those situations where he came with a, a duffel bag, and in that duffel bag was all of his belongings. And so it was, it was, um, you know, we were expected to be in a in a coat and tie every every away game. Um, so, you know, my parents felt compelled to to help who was my you know the guy who was my roommate and um you know later on became you know obviously a, a lifelong brother and lifelong friend but it was just one of those things where my parents are, are, are just even throughout their retirement have always been a part of giving and they've instilled that in, in all of us uh, so that was just a natural gesture for them they didn't think twice about it um, every time they came up to UVA, they tried to bring Ray a little something, especially our first year, um, because you know going to school on a on a scholarship doesn't include things like clothes, <laughs> like it, it like it may now, like it right, it, 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 right, right. It, it doesn't include things like clothing. It doesn't include like you know, little monies to be able to wash your clothes, go to the movies, you know, go out to dinner, you know, if you want things, just little things like that. And my parents were, uh, it just was natural for them to, to help Ray any way they, they, they could, uh, because you know, he was a kid in need at that time, but you know, Ray is a true rags to riches store. And, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm he, very proud to, to be, a, have been a part of. It. It's funny because when, when, it, when I, when I talked to Ray, he talked about times when he had a temper and when I, when I knew him, he was always smiling, just, just a gentle guy, but uh, it was interesting as a player, he had a temper. Now, your, your, your father, did he go to Virginia state? Your, your dad? No, my father went to North Carolina central. Okay. 
Yeah, my mm-hmm. dad was 53 at Virginia State. I'm sure he knew. He probably knew your uh, your uncles or your aunts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. So, so did what kind of sports parents were your parents? Did your did your um, your two brothers were Division One football players? Uh, yeah. Did your did your parents really? Uh, uh, was it important uh, to them that you guys you guys were good football players? No, it wasn't. Uh, they never pushed us at all to to play sports. The only thing they instilled in us was if you were going to start, you were going to finish. There's no quitting. There's no, you know, if things aren't going well or you're not on a good team, you know, you bow out. No, you, if you start something, you're going to finish it. And um, I can remember uh, there was a time where, you know, you know, I was playing for in, in, in Little League and my coach, I wanted to play running back. I loved having the ball in my hands. I wanted to play running back and he gave somebody else to start and running back job and, and put me at like tight end or something. So, and I, I told him I was quitting and came home uh, maybe 30 minutes after I came home. Uh, my coach rang the doorbell and had a conversation with my mom and dad and they quickly were like, uh, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. You're not quitting. You're going, he'll be there tomorrow. And I learned at that moment, um, you know, it, it's about uh, how you finish something and, and not how you, how you start it. And even at Virginia, when I got there as a, as a first year player and a first year student, Man, it was a it was a eye opening experience going from playing in high school for the love of the game to coming to a major Division One program and being a part of the business of football. It took some getting used to, and it was um, you had no time. I mean, the football university owns you owns all of your time pretty much, and I didn't like it. And I, I, again, I wanted to, wanted to quit after uh, that freshman year, my, my first year and over the Christmas holidays, you know, and I had, a, I was, I was one of only two freshmen to play, um, I played in the bowl game, you know, so had a decent uh, first year, but still it just was not fun anymore. And uh, we had that talk again uh, with my, with my parents and, and, you know, I, I, uh, actually took a sports psychology class that spring and it changed my entire outlook on on how to approach the game and um you know the rest was rest is history was that tom perrin uh was yeah. that class it was tom perrin. okay yeah yeah he was, he was a good teacher i think i took that class as well yeah uh, well before we get to your uva career let's go back to hampton mm-hmm. um hampton at the time was a football juggernaut uh hampton yeah. high school had won i don't know how many state championships but yeah. i think it won three in the 80s they'd won some in the 70s it yeah. was it was it was a football powerhouse uh before we get to uh even football why are so many great athletes from um the peninsula and also yeah. all hampton roads why mm-hmm. does it produce is it because you have the military kids you have you have working class people it's it's always like there's there's lawrence taylor there's I think Pernell Whitaker, there's, yeah. uh, I mean, I can go Alonzo, on. Out, out, Alonzo out. Morning, uh, Dwight Stevenson, you yeah. know, it, it, Alan Iverson, um, who I had the, the, the fortune of, of coaching when I went back home in my off seasons. But I, I, I just think the level of competition and the level of organization at the lower levels, um, at the, at the, the, when I was growing up, the, Little leagues were extremely competitive. I mean, the the games at I never forget Gosnell Hope Park, uh, all of the different leagues, whether it was midgets or intermediate level juniors, uh, they were. It was some in, very intense, very sophisticated, very organized football being played. And so, at a very early age, you learn that if you're going to play, you're going to have to play at a high level. And um, I think that just carries over into the high school level. And, it, and, and like you said, at that time, you know, college coaches, just because of the success of all of the teams in the district and the, and the quality of players, college coaches were just flocking to, to what we call the 757 uh, to, to recruit players. And 
for me at my high school, my coach did a great job. He had a wall. As you walk into the football facility, into the locker room, hit a wall of every kid that came through Bethel High School that got a football scholarship. He had a picture of them on, on the wall, an action shot a, you know, from their school. Uh, and it was just inspiring to walk by that every day. And knowing the back of my mind, I, I knew I, I can't, I, I want my picture on that wall. And um, it, was, it was a great thing to happen. Well, most of the kids you played with and against were they were they black kids or were the leagues um, uh, interracial? No, it was it was it was interracial. Um, it was probably at least 50, 50, 50 black and white, or, or maybe even sixty forty white to to black. Mm -hmm. um, but it was you know the the my, the teams themselves yeah were were pretty evenly split down the middle, mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, it, it was just a, a high level of competition, and and uh, I don't, I had never been through a, to, through a harder practice than what I did at Bethel High School. <laughs> was it was it, was there tension between the black kids and the white kids? You know, uh, in the periphery, it, it was with the student in the student body sometimes, but not not a, not in the athletic teams. Uh, we, we, I don't remember any incident where it was racially uh, motivated that, that, that became something where, you know, guys started fighting or, or, or having words or anything like that. So um, I, that was a blessing for me. Yeah. Well, um, uh, Hampton area was more a football area and the and Norfolk and the beach was more basketball. The Booker, mm -hmm. T. the Booker T. Washington teams won yep. a state championship two in a row. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I guess uh, J.R. Reed's Kempsville team was a really good team. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it wasn't until after, after you graduated, near when you were going to graduate, when Bethel became good, Hampton High won the state in basketball. It was mm -hmm. more of a football area. Was that just yeah. luck of the draw? Or uh, was that more, there was a conscious effort, kids were playing more basketball by, by that time? Well, you know, back to, back to the to the to the feeder schools, right? The basket uh, high middle school football middle school sports were abolished in in Tidewater, so you had to rely on those little league programs uh, to to play sports. So you played all the way through what is the junior leagues, which essentially should have been uh, middle middle school. Uh, sports. And that was, like I said, very sophisticated, very large in terms of uh, population of, of kids playing football. You did not see that in basketball. So I, consequently, I think the guys weren't really playing basketball until they got to high school. So they, they, they probably were not as um, developed in the sport as early on as you were with football because of the, the two that you got at, a, at younger ages. Who were your first heroes football that your, your brothers or did you like, you know, guys on TV, you tried, you tried to emulate. No, it was by far as my older brother. Um, I, I remember always just wanting to do everything that he did. And in fact, in, in, when he went to college, and uh, we, we would go up to the, to see Navy play. And Navy at that time was very, very competitive. They, uh, they had some, you know, Napoleon McCallum. Oh, yeah. Uh, Eddie, Eddie, uh, what was Eddie's the running back before the nap? Um, yeah. Uh, I can't remember. Well, both of those guys were, were at mentioned in the Heisman races uh, in their respective uh, time periods. Uh, so they were very, very competitive. And my parents would sit up in the stands with the rest of the parents. And I was down sitting on my knees on the first row in the, at the bottom of the aisle. And my eyes did not come off of, off of my brother. I, I watched every single move, every single interaction. Um, it was like, it was a movie. And I was, I was you know, watching that movie. Uh, but I wanted to do everything he 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 did, and you know it's you know the way fate had it is you know his college coach George Welsh, who recruited him and was in my house in my living room while I was young and running around in pajamas, 
ended up several years later being back in my house recruiting me. Um, so as fate ha had it, you know, we ended up being coached by the same, same, uh, same coach. Hmm. So what was Bethel like? Was Bethel always in the shadow of Hampton High School? In, in football, yes. You know, for Hampton, uh, like you said, they were winning the state championship at, at, at least every other year while I was in school, if not every year. And, uh, you know, those guys just, uh, they, they just had a juggernaut that we, we just could not overcome and, 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 uh, and, and beat. Oftentimes, it came down to that rivalry game, which was the last game of the season, to determine who was going to end up going to the playoffs. And they would, they would sometimes beat us bad, sometimes barely beat us. Um, or one, I remember one time we beat them, but they had a better district record, so they still went to the playoffs. So I was not blessed to to actually go to the playoffs at all uh, during my high school career, and a lot, I owe a lot of that to Hampton High School. Did, did you want to go to Hampton? I didn't. Um, again, it's mainly because um, at my at I, I wanted to be like my brother. I wanted to play quarterback at at, at Bethel just like Eric did. And uh, I wanted to wear number 10. And, um, I, you know, that's exactly what ended up happening. So I was very, very content um, at Bethel wearing the, wearing the green and gold. Is, is there a rivalry between the Hampton schools and the Newport News schools and also between oh, the Hampton schools and the, and, the, and the beach and Norfolk schools? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, you want to represent your city always. And um, so, yeah, it was always a, a good battle between it was it was it was much more than just Bethel versus Warwick or or but with Ray Savage. I, I remember playing Warwick with, and they had Ray Savage, they had Derek Steele, they had uh, man a, a lot of big time ballers. And uh, you know you're playing it's more it's bigger than Bethel versus Warwick. It was Hampton against Looper News, and um, so that made the rivalries that much more intense. Yeah. What was your coach like? Coach, uh, coach Kozlowski, I believe was his name. What, what was he like? Yeah. What, what did you learn from him? Discipline. Discipline and battling. He's the one, um, you know, I was always a small guy playing, playing football and one of the smallest on, on my team, smallest in my, my generation. Uh, I was one, a part of uh, four guys who were the first to eighth graders to play junior junior varsity football in in the city of Hampton. Um, the other three were Ray Ransom, a guy named William Beverly, and then Carl Francis, who's now the director of communications for the NFLPA. And um, Kaz was someone who uh, would break you down mentally, emotionally, physically, but then build you back up in, in a way that was so empowering and in, inspiring. And he taught me a quote that I, I used to motivate myself uh, in athletics for the rest of my career was he, he told me it's not the size of the dog in the fight that matters, it's the size of the fight in the dog. And so you gotta have that fight uh, to, to compete against the rest of these big dogs out here. And if you do that, you go with that and with that attitude, you'll be all right. And it's funny that, uh, you know, a lot of my high school teammates, uh, the big guys, you know, Creighton and Carminius and, and Carl Watts and all of these guys that went on to get division one scholarships as well. They, they, they nicknamed me pup because I was small, you know, they were the big dogs and I was, I was a pup. So, <laughs> uh, but Kaz was great. I owe him, I owe him so much. Fundamentally, uh, he was one of the best at teaching the fundamentals uh, and, and, and drilling it and drilling and drilling it so that when the pressure hit and the spotlight was on and your fatigue was, 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 was weighing down on you, what became your comfort zone was being fundamentally sound. And that's what carried me through uh, the rest of my athletic career is, is how fundamentally sound I, I played the game. And plus, you were fundamentally sound from your from your youth league uh, background um, yep. as well. So I was I was an undersized football player like you. Obviously, I was nowhere near as good as you were. Uh, how did you learn how to? You were very fast, but at UBA, I, I think you as a freshman, you were one fifty. 
or maybe you're a little bit bigger than that, but how'd you learn how to protect, protect yourself on the football field? Because you were, you were a durable player as well. Yeah. I weighed in actually at uh, freshman when we reported as freshmen, I weighed in at 158 pounds. Hmm. And um, the, the, the way I was able to protect myself is just by, by the fundamentals, right? You, you go in and, and tackle with the correct form. And the other thing Kyle's taught me was always use leverage and angles in everything that you do. So I don't care how big a guy was that I was going up to tackle. If I'm coming, if I'm hitting him in the right angle and I do some other tricks, uh, like, like I would hit and twist immediately. And I don't care how big you are, you're going to go where your knees go. So as soon as I hit and twist, start twisting, they're going to fall. Uh, because if they don't, they're going to lose that knee. And um, so uh, that was, that was you know, the, the basis of, of, every, of how I was able to protect myself. And, and, and you just go in being aggressive and, and uh, you know, good things will happen. Well, you were a great punt returner. And I, I used to return punts. And it's very hard to protect yourself on a punt because you're looking yeah. up and the ball is coming, and you know yes. your team wants you to get get something out of that return. Yeah. But there's not there's not a whole lot of places you can hide on a punt return. Did yeah. you enjoy returning punts? Or did you, did you feel vulnerable? I loved it. I I had lobbied uh, before my senior year to 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 give me for Coach Walsh to give me the opportunity to return punts because through, all through high school, high school I was a quarterback, so you know I was a wishbone quarterback. So I, I carried the ball 25 times a game. Is that and right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so I was used to having the ball in my hand. And I, uh, as a freshman, when you, we reported, we had to play both sides. We had to have an offensive position and a defensive position. And I tried my best. I wanted to be a receiver. I tried my best to for them to really be seen and notice as a receiver. And, and to be quite honest, I wasn't really trying that hard to be uh, when, on, when I was on the defensive side of the ball until, you know, Coach Welsh and Coach Baziani came to me and said, listen, uh, we see what you're doing and you're going to play corner. Yeah, so <laughs> let's, stop the, let's stop the shenanigans and, and really concentrate on being the best corner you can be. And um, so when I when he finally said yes, uh, he would give it a try. Uh, I was ecstatic, and I knew if after the first time that I would do it, I wasn't going to let it go. And we had a great, great scheme. Uh, Coach El Alma Phil Elmation, he made everybody believe on the punt return team that he it's not special teams. This is the first play of offense. And what is the goal on offense? To gain 10 yards to get a first down. So our goal was to get a first down every time I caught a punt. And the other thing he, he, he stressed, no punts hit the ground. So if you look in the history books, um, I had more punt returns that year than probably anybody in the last 50. Um, I think, but going back to Pat Chester and those guys uh, long, and back in the 70s. Um, so, you know, I, I really enjoyed it. It got, got, it took me, as soon as I caught the ball, I was back in high school. Yeah. And, you know, you, I, I tried to get a first down and, and, um, and, and we did. I think we averaged close to 13 yards of punt return. And at that time, I think I ended up somewhere like 12th or 13th in the nation and punt return yardage that year, that year. And uh, it was a blast. Yeah. Well, did, did you feel playing football in uh, the Tidewater um, in the peninsula 757 prepared you for the ACC? And also, did you have camaraderie with the, with your ex uh, opponents from, from that area, like Ray Savage? And uh, I mean, there's, there's so many mm -hmm. of them. Yeah, absolutely. I think it definitely prepared because like I said, on, on my high school team alone, there were probably from my sophomore year through my senior year, we probably sent 15 guys, 20 guys off to college on football scholarships. That's Many of them were division one. So I was already kind of playing 
with guys that had that that level of of play either playing with or playing against you know I, like i said i was playing against ray savage in high school i was playing against Derek still i was playing against doxy jordan i was playing against um uh dwight hallier and you know a whole bunch of those guys that were going on up to other schools in the acc to play so um, I felt like I belonged. I, I, I just needed to prove it. And it was, it was tough sledding. I mean, I got there as a freshman, I think when Coach Spaz put the first depth chart on the, on the board, I think I was like ninth <laughs> on the depth chart. And then, you know, you keep working hard and, and you, you do what you need to do. And, and by the first game, I was uh, second on the depth chart and I, I traveled every single game of my college career at Virginia, starting with the very first one, which was at the University of Georgia, down between the hedges. It was at that game though, that I realized, okay, maybe I should have gone to JMU or something like that, because that those boys were, were at another level. And I, I was a little doubtful that I would have success when watching us get killed by the University of Georgia that very first game. So you considered other schools besides UVA, even though your brother had played for uh, George Walsh? Oh yeah, yeah. No, I, it was it was this constant battle. Uh, you know, people tell it. Some people telling me you need to go Division One, Division One. Other people telling me you should go Division Two. Other people telling me you should go to you know one double A. Uh, because all because of my size. Um, ultimately, you know, talking with my brother, talking with my parents, you know, we decided Virginia's a great school. If you don't play it down, you're going to get a great education and live the rest of your life. But go see what you can do and play and, and play at the division one level. And because if you go to JMU and you do well, you're always going to wonder if I could have done it at Virginia. Or if I could have done it at Virginia Tech or any or anywhere else. Um, and it's always if you want to transfer, it's always easier to transfer down a level than to go up a level. You don't have to sit out that year. So um, that was my that was my thinking. And um, I'm glad I made the right decision. What was the transition like from working class Tywater to, to, to UVA as, as a student? It was, uh, it was, it was interesting. Um, you know, it, first of all, when I first got to UVA, I was kind of in that bubble, that small little bubble where it felt like home with summer prep and kind of people that were, had similar backgrounds and, and coming from the kind of the same financial situation. Um, and then when the regular school year hit, that's when you realize, wow, okay. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm in a, I'm in a, in, a, in the, the living amongst the, the elite in, in a lot of ways. Um, and, and that, so that part was definitely a, a, an eye opener because, you know, we, I didn't have a car, I, you know, we were, I was riding a bus everywhere or walking and, uh, you know, it was definitely different once the, the, the school year hit. Yeah. Well, football, as you said, you, you got off to a little bit of a slow start, but you, you, you caught on quickly. Uh, and by, by the end of the year, there was a decision that had to be made. If you, if you, if you sat out the rest of the year, you could redshirt and have, an, you have a, fifth, a fifth year. Mm -hmm. But there, there came to be a decision, um, I guess uh, I, there was an injury to a cornerback, mm -hmm. and they were deciding between you and Ryan Jackson. And I think another, mm -hmm. another uh, Ryan Jackson's guy, I, I used to play ball with a lot. And yeah. they, they threw you into the, uh, into the mix. Yeah. So, so uh, describe that. Were you, and, and were you a little disappointed that it may jeopardize your redshirt? Well, the, the ironic thing is the first two or three weeks of the season, I thought I was going to play because I was second on the depth chart. And there was a game where Keith McMains, who was in front of me, uh, who the previous year led the nation in interception, was named All-American. Um, he got hurt with something. Uh, it wasn't a serious injury, but here I am second on the depth chart. So I naturally thought I was about to play and they put in Ryan instead, who was third, you know, he was third, technically third on the depth chart. And that continued to happen 
And so I, I said, okay, I, I guess this is a technicality that they're just keeping me number two on the depth chart, but they're not going to play me um, and playing the, to go ahead and play the two seniors. It was, it was Ryan and David Cardenas was the, was the other corner. And um, so I stopped wearing my pads, my knee pads, my, my thigh pads and everything. I was just kind of putting my pants on because I, I didn't think I was going to play. I mean, I, they had proven that they were not going to put me in. And for some reason, that game, uh, something happened where someone saw that I didn't, wasn't putting my pads in and they made me put my pads in to, you know, as of before I went out. And luckily I did because, you know, Keith got hurt and it was a tight game. We were, play, we were playing North Carolina at home. And I'll never forget Coach Welsh kind of just busting through the crowd and said and, and told Spass, uh, he said, put Wallace in. I was like, what? <laughs> you know, and, and uh Spaz looked at me, kind of it with a with a disappointing look on his face because he knew what that meant, and I knew what that meant. Uh, but he said, "All right, man, it's it's your you're up. Let's go." And uh, I ran out on the on the on the, on the field. I was so scared. <laughs> I can't even tell you how scared I was. And I was so scared. I was trembling so bad that. Uh, Daryl Hammond yeah, had, to but, had to button my chin strap. I, I, I couldn't even button my chin strap. Mm -hmm. And two or three plays later, North Carolina threw a, a speed out on me on the opposites, not on our home sideline, but on their sideline. And uh, Marriott was the receiver. He caught it, turned up field. He caught it. I missed the tackle. He turned up field and ran for a touchdown for like, like a 45, 50 yard touchdown, which put them ahead. And I was like, oh my gosh, I, I was. And, and, and ironically, one of my high school teammates was their starting left tackle. Named Creighton and Grimini's. And uh, as I'm jogging back from their sideline back to our sideline, he walk, he runs straight over to me and he grabs me by the chest and says, Get your head up and go play ball. And that kind of woke me up. And I went off to the sideline. I came back in. Next time we 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 had the ball, I ended up having a great rest of that game. And then we scored, went back up, and they got the ball with about a minute and something left and was driving. And then they threw a deep ball on me. And I almost intercepted it, but I, I was able to knock it down. Uh, and it was like, it was the, it was their desperation play, and it, it helped. So I, that play helped secure our victory. And from there, you know, I ended up. I just, I, I just, I, I felt that was I was in my place, and I, I had something to prove. Uh, so I, I, I just played played ball from there. The life of, of a cornerback in college football is kind of a lonely life. You, first of all, you got to come up and force to run sometimes against you know two hundred and thirty pound running backs. Yeah. But I mean, you're out there by yourself. Uh, was there a lot of pressure playing defensive back at UVA? Yeah, it's a lot of pressure. Um, so I played what is called strong corner my entire time at Virginia, which means I'm always out to the wide side of the field. Hmm. So you put, your fat, you put your fast guy there. Yeah, re receivers have a two way go. They have enough room out there because of how wide the hash marks are in college football, where they could run a route to the inside or they can run a route to the outside. They have equal amounts of space. And uh, so, yeah, I'm out there by myself and it's, and, and 50,000 people know when I make a mistake. <laughs> and and uh, so it's a lot of pressure. And, and for me, I, you know, you, I was never the kind of guy that got too high and I tried not to get too low because uh, that the nature of that position, you have to be, you have to forget the last play, whether it was good or bad, 
and zero in on 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 the next one. And and most of the time, teams had their best receivers out on, on the wide side of the field. So because of all of the room that they had to operate, so I was typically going up against the other team's best receiver for the majority of the game. So it was a it was a it was a tough position, but I take pride in and and how well I did. Is it is it tough on an athlete uh, to be vulnerable? You're you're out there, you're you're alone sometimes. But even the basketball team, you're shooting big foul shots. You're going to miss some. Is it is it tough to, to to handle the pressure of the whole university? It's on your back, and then you know, on Monday and Tuesday, you're walking around like a student. Uh, mm-hmm. Do you ever feel any responsibility? Uh, you know, after after things don't go well. Yeah, man. Because uh, you know the the press is 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 unrelenting. You know, and um. I, I can tell you uh, the next year, my sophomore year, I can give you a perfect example. My sophomore year, uh, we were playing Clemson and we were winning and Clemson did a trick play, which is now outlawed, where they sent a whole bunch of people into the, to the huddle and then sent a whole bunch of people out, but they left one guy that stood right on the sideline, yeah. in the in the field of play, r- right in front of their bench, and when they broke, so when that happened, I automatically assume all of those guys were going off of the field, and so when they came up to the line of scrimmage, the widest guy on the field was the tight end, so that's who I lined up over, and was ready to you know do my responsibilities. So they quickly snapped the ball. And I remember seeing their quarterback throw the ball up, you know, over my head. And I'm like, where is he throwing the ball to? And I, that guy that was standing on the sideline ran down the field, caught that pass and went in for a touchdown. And we lost. Uh, now, if, if you remember, we had the longest losing streak of one school over another school in the history of college football. We had lost to Clemson at that time when we lost that game, it was the 28th straight time we lost to Clemson. And it was the hundredth anniversary Hmm. of Virginia football and it was homecoming. So (laughs) the next day, even after that game, there were 50, 60 reporters, TV cameras in my face, interviewing me, you know, how come you couldn't see the obvious? Uh, You know, you know, how does it feel to be the main reason why this streak continues? And so, you know, the next day in the papers, that's all you saw. Jason Wallace, Jason Wallace this, Jason Wallace that, the streak continues, everything. And yeah, you know, you got to walk around and go to go to class, to, you know, and not every student was supportive of, <laughs> of me to overcome that. So it was a it was tough. It was tough. So, yes, you know, it's a lot of pressure and, and not just the, the Charlottesville paper, but, you know, the Cavalier Daily, you know, was writing <laughs> stuff, too. Um, and, uh, you know, but again, even through that. You know, I just stayed prayerful and and I stayed, you know, Ray Roberts, Myron Martin, Tyrone Lewis, Sean Moore, Ray Savage, you know, guys like that helped help me keep my my uh, my head and, uh, you know, help me continue to grind and, and challenge me. Derek Dooley, you know, guys like that uh, to, to keep pushing forward and, 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 and do better, you know, the good thing about it, they were they were saying all said, you know, we you got a game next week to change the change the story to change the narrative and uh for you know as you know the two years later my senior year is where i had that long punt return against clemson to help secure our first victory uh, in the history of that rivalry so uh, i i was able to flip the script completely and you know then of course the all of the papers the next day was like from from uh, from goat to hero, you know, and uh, it was a good re- good redemption story. So it's funny. I, I always thought the, the, the Daily Progress was very friendly to the UVA. So you're saying they they could be very critical to the to the athletes. Yeah, I mean, when uh, especially in situations like that, where 
you know, you're, you know, of course, no one play can win or lose a game, but in in a, in in the media's eyes, that was the that was the play that lost the game for us. And uh, outside the ironic thing, outside of that, I had a great game. I had like 10, 12 tackles. I had a couple of pass breakups. I had, um, you know, Terry Allen was there running their tailback. He was yeah. one of the best to ever do it. He's he broke free. I tracked him down from the other side of the field and had a touchdown saving tackle. Um, you know, so they, you know, you don't mention it. They don't mention any of that. They just focused on on that one play. But um, yeah, they can all of the all of the, play, the the papers can be critical when when they want to be. Yeah, who was the hardest guy you had you had to guard on a, on a regular basis? And it, and also, who was the hardest guy you had to tackle out of the backfield? Um, the hardest guy to, to guard. Uh, Ricky Pro was 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 tough. Yeah, he had a good uh, he had a good NFL career, didn't he? He did. Yeah. He did. Yeah. Ricky Pro was tough. Yeah. Um, uh, Rocket Ishmael from Notre Dame was by far the toughest because of uh, the, he he was just the fastest guy you ever see, and um, so that that made it really really tough. Uh, and then you know there was uh, also. The, the the guy from uh, Illinois or that we played in the bowl game was was um, was a really good receiver and, and challenging, and I and I in, in in terms of Virginia, I mean you know going up against Herman Moore and before him uh, you know John Ford they John taught Ford. they taught me a lot you know John was all American and 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 just as fast as Rocket Ishmael and, and he was a a great litmus test for me throughout training camp my freshman year. I, whereas some guys may act like they had to tie their shoes when it was time to go up against him, you know, in one-on-one drills, I really flourished in trying to go up against the best as much as I could. Because if I was a step close to John, then I would be right on somebody else, anybody else. And, and being able to break up that pass or, or even get an interception. So, um, you know, it, Herman and, and, and John were right up there too. Yeah. John's a guy we don't talk about much and he could be a tough matchup because not only was he fast, he was a big dude big, also. Big boy. Yes. Yeah. Uh, he was, he was a low. And, uh, uh, but in terms of running backs to tackle, um, you know, Chris Warren was, was a beast. That's my uh, own boy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he was a beast. Uh, Terry Allen was really good at at, at um, Clemson, and so was uh, 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 playing at no- when we played Notre Dame. You know they had Jerome Bettis, they had Ricky oh, Waters, <laughs> uh, and uh, when we played Penn State, um, and we beat Penn State at Penn State, we completely shut down their their All American running back at that time. I can't even remember his name. I'm getting old, yeah. uh, but you know, there was, it was always a challenge every week. It was a challenge. Yeah. One of the biggest plays of your career, uh, that one of your, the first of your big plays of your career was the pick six you had against NC state. Do you, do you remember that play? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that was a tough, that was a, a big game for us because they were ranked in the top 20. We were ranked in the top 20. We were playing at their place. Uh, and it was an early fall, uh, game where the weather was just starting to change to change get a little a little uh, a little cold um and they had some playmakers on their squad um they had uh you know some demons of back some receivers that were very very highly regarded so we knew that was going to be a tough matchup and um i was well prepared for some of the plays that i knew they were going to try to run on me uh and i love when people try to run corner routes on me because I think fundamentally I had the footwork to to cover that route better than uh, anybody, in my opinion. And uh, they tried to run it on me twice, and I, I picked them twice. Yeah. <laughs> so I wanted them to throw that because I knew I I, I, I was going to be ready coming out of that break to, to pick it. And then, again, got the ball in my hands. I think things like that helped me convince George Welsh to give me the opportunity to return to return punts is is uh, seeing things like that. That picks 
was the daily progress and the Cavalier daily nice to you after after that game? They were, they were all in all for the rest of my career. They uh, they they covered me very very well. I have a lot of nice articles from from both of them. Well, let's get to your the the mythical uh, uh, 1990 season, your senior year, and you mentioned earlier your punt return against against Clemson, and that was a big win for us because that was really one of our only really tough opponents early in the season. And once we got by Clemson. Um, you know, we, we had, we had a chance to kind of run the, run the table a little bit, Mm -hmm, but, mm -hmm. but I understand your, your grandmother had died, uh, that week and you had, you had to play. I, I, they they might not have even told you that after the game. That's correct. Um, yeah, my grandmother had passed away that Friday night. Um, and and the the ironic thing is when I ran that punt return, uh, and they knocked me out of bounds, the first thing I did was on the ground was to I was just exalting with my arms out and kind of looking up 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 in the heavens uh you know just saying thank thank you and I do believe it was her spirit because she was a huge sports fan and a huge supporter of me um and I do think there was some divine intervention for uh for me to have that play in that game at that moment uh but yeah, it was it was heartbreaking to get that news that she had she had died um, after that game. Well, you you set a record for punt returns that that year. You guys had just a great year, um, and I mean, uh, the, was was the pressure building every week? I, I remember walking by uh, Mensers, and I and I remember seeing the Sports Illustrated, or no, it was mm-hmm. USA Today. Mm-hmm. It had UVA number one. I remember I bought the paper, mm-hmm. and I just kept it out. It was just so weird. The scene, we were, we were number one team in the nation. Uh, do, yeah. you, do you remember that moment? And, 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 yeah. and yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It was, yeah, it was, a, it was pressure. Um, and you know, Sean at the time was was a Heisman candidate. Um, so yeah, that was a, it was a lot of pressure. But at the same time, I mean, we had one of the best offenses in in the country, and. Everything, all the fluky things that could have happened in a game happened for when we lost that game to Georgia Tech. And um, when, when that happened, man, you talk about a monumental loss. Yeah. We, we lost everything. We lost the ACC championship that game. We lost our chance to play for the national championship. Um, we lost our number one ranking. So uh, it, was, it was a tough, it was tough to go to practice that next week. I remember the first half of that game. And I've, I've talked to people about that. No one else remembers this. But I, I remember you guys had substitutes in the game in the first half. I mean, the game was going so well. Mm-hmm. I don't even think we thought this is going to be much of a problem. I think, I think in the second quarter, we thought we were going to beat them. And Coach Welsh was, was, was resting some of his, some of his folks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I said, everything was going, going exactly as we planned it yeah. in that first half. Yeah. Uh, and then the, some very fluke things happened. You know, I, I, one of the fumbles that Sean had, uh, you know, one of our own players' leg flew up when oh, he was going right. to make a block to knock yeah. the ball out of Sean, Sean's hand. Um, I, you know, I, I gave up two touchdowns in my entire uh, career at Virginia. One was that very first game against Carolina. And the second was uh, out and up that the guy ran from against me at, at, in that Georgia Tech game. I'm sorry. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, like I said, so all of the things that were, that were not normal for us, uh, you know, became normalized that game. I guess it's the law of averages, you know, just hit us. And, and uh, we had a lot of fluky things happen that caused us to lose that game. Two of the uh, the most underrated players in college football that year were Sean Sean Jones and William Bell. Mm-hmm. They were they were really good football players, and yeah. they, they kind of came out of nowhere. And and they did. You know, by by the end of the year, they had, they had taken Georgia Tech to a to a share of the national title. Right. Yeah. yeah. It, and that should have been us. I, that that should have been us. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it's a it's a it's a big one. It's a big one. Well, th- you know, you came back, you bounced back uh, after that loss, and you went down to Carolina. Carolina had a good team that that year. Mm-hmm. Bounce back and you won. It had to be a great feeling uh, bouncing back and winning that game against Carolina. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we were determined not to let that that that, that loss, um, you know, determine the rest of our season. And uh, we went out there focused. Um, I, I think with it being away from Charlottesville helped. You know, we it was just us against the world kind of kind of thing. 
And uh, yeah, we went down there and took it to them. And, and we felt good coming back from Carolina uh, about what the rest of the season looked like, you know, to finish the season 12 and one still put puts us, you know, right at the top. So that was the goal. Yeah. The Maryland game was one, another game where things just kept, kept going wrong. Yeah. Uh, Maryland had a, had, a, had a decent team, but I believe Sean got hurt in, in the Maryland game. Yeah. And that, that's when things kind of unraveled for us. Yeah. Yeah. When he got hurt, you know, it kind of broke our spirits and, um, and, and, and we just couldn't recover. We just couldn't recover. We were, that's when we realized we weren't, I guess, as strong as we needed to be, um, not from, not physically, but just emotionally, you know, it, it, um, and that just took its toll on us. And, and, and yeah, that, that was an ugly game. Yeah. Well, the good news is they, they bowl bids went out early in those days. So yeah. we got, we got the sugar bowl and we would yeah. have never gotten that if they would have waited, waited until the end of the season. I Correct. remember driving, I remember driving down there to watch you guys play and we didn't know what to expect because uh, uh, tech had blown us out, but you guys mm -hmm. really played a nice game in the sugar bowl. Yeah, we did. I mean, a lot of guys, you know, even though I was not the same academic year as Sean, and and a lot of those guys, you know, we because I played as a freshman, we were we were we were I was a, 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 at the same time with them. I was I was this was my last game, and it was their last game. So we were determined to go out there, and and we went out there thinking, expecting to win that game, and. Um, yeah, we played we played a heck of a game and they 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 barely they barely squeaked it out. Yeah, it was a great game. Well, look, uh, uh, Jason, this has been great. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your post UVA journey? I know you've had a, a great career, a corporate career, but also you've gotten in this. I believe Zumba is is mm -hmm. what you do. So you mm -hmm. you teach uh, yeah. um, uh, fitness as well. So talk about your, your life after UVA. Yeah, I um, you know, I finally I, I was work. I got a job. Was working um after playing uh you know professional football I, I had a short stint in the nfl and then went up to canada uh played in the cfl for five years had a great great career there and uh, until i tore my shoulder up and, and um had surgery and then so I, I i went came to texas to get my my surgery that's where dr McHugh recommended me to come down to a, a specialist down in texas in san antonio had my surgery my rehab was so long, I kind of planted my feet and, and just started working. And uh, eventually after 9-11 hit um, and all of the indus industries tanked, uh, that's when I realized, I, I tried to figure out where, what was the, where was the growth, job growth gonna be in the next 20 years and, and everything pointed towards healthcare. So that's when I went back to school, got my, uh, my MBA with a concentration in healthcare administration and, and, um, and, and started working in healthcare. And I've been in healthcare ever since. Um, right now I'm the COO of a healthcare company oh, that primarily focuses on delivering uh, medical, dental, vision, behavioral health, um, imaging services uh, for the underserved communities. Hmm. And uh, once I stopped playing, having, been forced to work out all your all my life. I, I just I took a, a long sabbatical from from that and and eventually started getting to the point where I was like, okay, I can't be one of these uh, little guys with a big belly. Uh, so you know, let's let's get back into the gym. And uh, I, I found Zumba and I started taking it. It was one of, it was one of those classes where uh, it's fun. Uh, you're burning a lot of calories more so than you do when you are on the treadmill or, or on the elliptical machine, and you don't feel like you're working out. And I, I just fell in love with it. I took it for about two years, and then uh, you know someone recommended that I become get certified and become a teacher myself. And you know after thinking about it for a while, I ended up finally doing that. And uh, so I've been a Zumba instructor now for 12 years. Oh, wow. And um, I've been blessed. Uh, uh, I worked for 24 Hour Fitness uh, initially for uh, almost 10 years. And nine of those years, I had one of the top classes in the country, uh, averaging over 100 people per class. That's awesome. And um, it's it's fun. It's a way to uh, impact people's lives through, through fitness. 
And um, I, I take a lot of pride in doing that. I uh, had my own studio for five years uh, and, and, and uh, became a certified personal trainer as well. So, you know, it's just something that I've, uh, I've, um, I've really enjoyed doing uh, in the middle uh, in the middle of the pandemic, I, I have a herniated disc in my back and could barely move. I ended up having a couple of procedures and, you know, I promised myself if I was ever given the gift, uh, if God would ever give me the gift of movement again, I was going to uh, continue to try to impact people's lives and through fitness. And, and um, so I started teaching again. Oh. So I'm still, I'm still doing it. And um, it's a great way to stay in shape and, um, and make a little money doing it too. Yeah, well, well, Jason, you've had you've had a great uh, uh, journey. Uh, you know, thanks so much for sharing it. Uh, you know, next time you're, you're in town, I know your brother lives uh, not too far away. Yeah. Uh, and you know, and, and he lives he lives in a much uh, uh, classier zip code than I live in. But uh, <laughs> you know, with, I'd love to get a coffee with you. I don't. I, don't, I think we played pickup basketball many years ago. Mm-hmm. But, I, but I haven't seen you in person probably since since the UVA yeah. days. Yeah, it's been a long time. So I will definitely have to catch up when I when I next time I come to Northern Virginia for sure. Yeah, it's been great talking to uh, Hampton Roads and uh, UVA football with you. You got you really had an impact, and it was nice to see a guy your size um, who was able to you know you were you were perennially uh, David going against Goliath, and 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 you won a lot of big games. Yeah, no, it was a, it was a blessing, and I appreciate you having me, and and, and I really enjoyed talking with you. Yeah, it's been great, Jason. Well, look, let's, let's keep in contact, and, I, and hopefully I'll see you soon. Will do. Will do. Okay, Thanks, Julie. Uh, happy holidays. All right, you too. Bye.